appreciate it, guys. Well, if you love Jesus today, say amen. Amen. Let me invite you to get your Bible. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8 this morning. Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. And, uh, but really, the message is actually going to come from 2 Kings 13. You probably don't see that in the bulletin. You probably uh, don't see that on the screen yet. But the message is actually going to be in 2 Kings chapter 13. But I'm going to uh, read, uh, first of all, it's going to be our springboard, Romans chapter 8. And as you're finding that, uh, Kim and I like to thank all of you for the love that you have shown us uh, during the passing of her father. Her father went home to be with the Lord uh, just the other day, and we loved him so much. He was 82 years old, and he passed away quietly in his home. And, you know, we walked in there, and there he was uh, lying on the couch, and looked like he was asleep, and and I tell you, if there's a way to go on to glory, that's the way to go to glory right there, ladies and gentlemen. So we thank you for your love, your cards, your prayers. You, you showed us a lot of goodness, and we do appreciate that. Well, uh, Thanksgiving is just around the corner, and uh, Jay Crawford, where's Jay? There's Jay. Um, we, we're having here at the church a Thanksgiving meal this Wednesday. What time does that begin, James? Uh, Jay? Six o'clock. And I think a lot of you have already signed up to eat with us at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a Thanksgiving service here. It's going to be in the Mac building. And, um, but Jay says if you haven't already signed up and, and you're looking for a good meal, you know, that's something I, I'm always looking for is, is a good meal. I love to eat. Can I get an amen? I, I love to eat. So uh, there's room for you. Uh, I understand that the meal is going to come from Lorenda's. Have you all ever... Eating at Lorenda's, any of y'all? You know, I, this is not Lorenda's, but I had a doctor tell me one time, he said as long as um, the Beacon in Spartanburg is open and Wade's is open, he'll be open. You know, I don't know what he means by that. But uh, Lorenda's is good home cooking, and uh, we invite you to come if you'd like to come, if you're not already doing something with, with your family. Um, so happy Thanksgiving, and, and I hope your, your home is filled with uh, lots of joy. And like Max said earlier, uh, goodness, pack it, uh, pack it full of people, you know. Kim and I have actually thought about, you know, if we don't have a full house uh, of people, we may go out in the, and we, we live in the country, but we may go up in Woodruff and find a few people and, and just bring them in, bring them in. And, and then we're going to take a picture of it, send it to Dr. Fouch. Dr. Fouch is going to get that picture. Or our favorite Democrat governor, you know, one of the two. And uh, say, hey. This is Thanksgiving right here, ladies and gentlemen. We, we gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving him thanks. Amen. And so uh, we're, we're going to do that. So happy Thanksgiving. You know, the early service this morning, I've been away for a little while, and, and I think a lot of y'all know me. If I'm away a little while, it just gets crazy. It gets a little crazy. But, you know, I was unfiltered this morning. And, you know, us preachers sometimes when we get unfiltered and we say things that just let the good times roll, we... Afterwards, we, we say, man, that was kind of rough. I, you know, that was for breakfast this morning, too, you know, for the 8.30 service, so it kind of came heavy. So I, I unloaded a lot this morning, and, um, and I think I got a little bit more left. Uh, are y'all ready for it? You, you know, my, my, my goal this morning, you see, we're on Facebook right now. You know, there are haters of free speech. Facebook hates free speech. So Facebook is coming. It's coming. And uh, my goal is for you to put me in Facebook jail, all right? So praise the Lord. And it's a badge of honor, praise God, to be in Facebook jail. Jail, jail. They may get me, but I'm going to go down fighting. Amen, amen. All righty, more than victorious. Did y'all know that you're more than victorious? Amen. We're going to leave this place saying, hey, I got victory in Jesus. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 37, 38, and 39. This is the springboard. We're just going to go here, hop off, and then just head out with Jesus, okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 37. More than victorious. We, we know this well. The Bible says here, yet in all things, all things, all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, praise God, shall be able to separate us 
not even Dr. Fauci, praise God, separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for granting us the religious liberty and freedom to gather in this place right now to worship the Lord God Almighty in spirit and in, in truth. Dear Father, I thank you for the remnant, the faithful few who stay by the stuff no matter what evil is thrown at them. And, and I pray, Father, for my carnal brother this morning who's living in the flesh, who's living for the devil when he should be living for Jesus. I pray, Father, for a, a holy move of a holy God in his life, that he may get right with thee. And dear God, I pray for all of our churches today and all of our preachers who stand and give a testimony of their life, ministry, that they may preach the unadulterated Word of God today, unfiltered. And we pray, Father, that in these end of days, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will take its rightful place to begin to believe again in what God has said and what God has done and what God is doing. We are living in some very interesting times. The black velvet upon which the diamond of God's grace is going to be displayed. And we look forward into, with anticipation and excitement, dear God, about what you're going to do. I'm looking forward to it. And dear God, we just pray that you'll honor your word as you always do. May the Holy Spirit of God be our teacher today. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary. And may we hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, which is a name above every name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I've entitled the message today, More Than Conquerors, because you see, in Christ Jesus, are we not more than conquerors? Amen. We really, really are. And by the way, let me remind you, as, as we battle, as we war in this present age, I want you to remember this. We're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from it. Amen? Because victory was won more than 2,000 years ago at Calvary, ladies and gentlemen. So we don't fight for it, we fight from it. Jesus won the victory for us, and ladies and gentlemen, if you're in Christ Jesus, you have the victory. Amen? So, hey, we sing it, don't we, sometimes, up from the grave he arose, didn't he? With a mighty triumph over his foes, he arose a victor from the dark domain, ladies and gentlemen, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And if you believe that, give God the praise today. Amen. Amen, he arose. But sometimes, you know, it seems like we're losing. You ever feel like that sometimes? Man. Boy, I talk to a lot of people, and I'm sure you do too, and sometimes, man, it just seems like we're losing. You, you, you hear what people say, and you look at the world scene today, and you think, my goodness, you know how many of us complained about the year 2020? <laughs> well, we've done a lot of complaining about the year 2020, haven't we, uh, ladies and gentlemen? But really, uh, some of this has been coming on for a long, long time. You think about it. Man, I think about, I think about those great Christian schools that we once had in America especially up there in the Northeast, those, church, those schools that sent out preachers and missionaries, Harvard, Brown, all those Ivy League schools that were once bastions of, Christian, of biblical Christianity are today no, no more than cesspools of modern American liberalism and, and Marxism. It's a crying shame. I think about many churches in our land today who once stood tall, as, as beacons of truth and right tradition. And they have yielded their position in the world and have become more like the world than more like Jesus Christ. And it's a crying shame. 
And, and sometimes you look around, man, you see Christians here and you see Christians there. Man, they're growing weary. They're walking around with their head down and, man, they're just battle-weary, battle-weary. And yet the Bible says, don't grow weary in doing good, amen? Because in due season, you'll reap if you don't lose heart. Don't lose heart, folks. Hey, we're more than victorious. Claim the victory. It is rightfully yours. We're not losers. We're winners. And if you believe that, give God the praise this morning. Amen. Amen. It, it, it's high time, ladies and gentlemen, that we begin to believe afresh and anew of what God says in His Word and what God is doing in our lives, what He's doing in our churches. God is at work. And I'm here to tell you, no matter how foolish things may seem today and, and how powerless you may think you are, God Almighty has not surrendered His authority. God is still... A sovereign, almighty God. El Shaddai, almighty God. Now, let me ask you uh, this morning to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 13 because this is where the meat of the message is going to be today. And, and I want you to know, God says to you and God says to me that He wants to give you victory every single day of your life. Hey, it, it ain't in our DNA to lose, ladies and gentlemen. Because we are not just conquerors, but more than super conquerors is what you are and what I am in Jesus Christ. And do not let the devil tell you otherwise. Amen? So look at it this morning, 2 Kings chapter 13 and 14. And I'm going to read it to you first of all, and then I'm going to kind of give you the, the setting, the atmosphere in which uh, these scriptures right here were written. They were written many, many years ago, but they are as true and they are as relevant as the morning newspaper, ladies and gentlemen. But the morning newspaper is not true, but they try to tell you relevant news, okay? It's all, most of it's fake, phony. Look at what he says here. Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. He did not have coronavirus, by the way, okay? I don't know what he had, but it wasn't coronavirus. Elijah had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. So you can see right now that the king, man, he's feeling powerless. He's, fe he's feeling defeated. He, he, he's fe he, he feels like, man, this is lost. He, and back in those days, they would go to the men of God. What, what's God doing? What's God going to do? And so the king goes to this man of God, Elisha. And so he says, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. And Elisha, watch this, put his hand on the king's hand. And he said, open the east window. Why the east? Open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syrians and Aphek till you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrow, so he took it, or took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. And he struck three times and stopped. That's where he messed up. The king. And the man of God was angry with him, and he said, you should have struck five or six times, then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But, now you will strike Syria only three times. Any of y'all familiar with this section of the Bible? Let me kind of go back over this a little bit so you can kind of get it in your mind and see what God is wanting to do for you today, what God is wanting to do for our nation today. Uh, so here's the situation. Here's what's going on. Elisha is the prophet of God, and he's, he's 80 years old. He is sick with some sort of illness, and he is about to die. Elisha is very frail. 
at this moment. Elisha is very sick at this time. And so uh, here comes the king, the king of Israel, King Joash. He comes. Well, now, Elisha, this time, he sort of reclined in a cottage. And King Joash comes, and he's knocking on the door. And as you can see from reading the scriptures, King Joash, he's alarmed. He's very alarmed. His army has been decimated. The Syrian army, the enemy, they're coming from the north. They're coming from the east. King Joash, the king, at this moment, he feels powerless. He feels defeated. And he goes to the man of God. And he reclines, he throws himself on the man of God. And he's weeping and he feels despair. And you see what he says? Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. You see what he's saying there? So King Joash at this point is utterly overwhelmed, feeling powerless. And, you know, I got a feeling that there are a lot of people in America today that are right where King Joash was in his day. There's a lot of people in America today because they're looking across the landscape and they're feeling defeated, even Christians, preachers, prophets of God, feeling defeated, feeling powerless. And they're thinking, man, how are we going to get out of this? What is God doing? Where is God? In all this, if you don't take anything away from the the message, take this away from the message. And there's a lot to unpack in this this morning. But ladies and gentlemen, I think if you've been a Christian, a believer, and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ for very long, and you have followed him faithfully, you know there's the ebb and flow of life. And you know none of us are exempt from problems, everyday problems. None of us are exempt from evil striking you and your family. None of us are exempt from those things. But ladies and gentlemen, I think if you're a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, would you not agree with me that God does His best work when it seems to be the darkest? God does His best work when we feel overwhelmed and powerless. And God is fixing to do something for Him in such a way to grant Him victory. But we have to be faithful. We have to be obedient God, God, God's working in our lives depends on our faithfulness. It depends on our obedience. And even at that, God, can, God works outside of that because all things will work together for good to those who love Him and call it according to His purpose. God's ultimate sovereign will will not be thwarted by the devil and his forces of hell. God's will will be achieved. It is being achieved right now. Right now. And so that's the scene, that's the atmosphere. And so what I want to do for you right now is I want us to walk uh, step by step through these scriptures this morning. And so to sort of keep in mind, okay, I've told you the setting, I've told you the atmosphere, and I want you to believe, believe in faith this morning that God wants to give you absolute victory over the enemy every single day of your life. So I'm going to show you through the Word of God this morning how God does that. And we're going to go step by step through that. But man, I got to claim it. I got to, I got to acknowledge my position in Jesus Christ, that I am a joint heir of Him. And I am a minister of reconciliation. I am saw the earth. I am light of the world. I am more than victorious in Christ Jesus. There's no doubt about that. And so here's what I want to show you this morning. Maybe three, maybe four things that we're going to unpack this morning. So first of all, there's the mandate for victory. God has a mandate for victory. That you may have victory every single day of your life over the enemy, ladies and gentlemen. So keep your Bible open. Look down here at verse 17. God's got a purpose for you, and that purpose is that you win. Uh, He's got a mandate for victory. And for King Joash, it's revealed right here in this passage. God has a mandate for him to win. 
God has a mandate for you to win. Now, notice what Elisha, the prophet, tells the king. Now, here's the king of Israel. And the king, now keep in mind at this time, he's feeling powerless. He's feeling defeated. He's wondering, where is God in all of this? So Elisha says to Joash, take a bow and some arrows. Open the east window and you shoot the arrow. So Joash shoots the arrow out of the east w window. Now notice down here in verse 17 what the, the man of God called the arrow that the king shot. What's the arrow called? What does he name? How does he name it? He says right here, look at what Elisha said. Elisha called it the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria. In other words, what he's saying here to the king is this. Deliverance is going to come from God. God is the ultimate, the ultimate in bringing victory for you. It won't be done by your army. It won't be by, done by you. But God will give you the victory. Victory ultimately comes from God. And here's what I want to say this morning too. You know, I really believe that God wants his people to, to not just survive, but I believe he wants us to thrive. Do you believe that this morning? I believe that. Uh, it's, it's not in us just to survive. It's in us to thrive because we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are children of the most high God. Amen. So, so, and there's a lot of Christians that, that just, just, just survive. That's all they do. They just they just survive. They, 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 they sing, oh, let's just hold down the fort. That's their, that's their theme song, holding down the fort. And when we ought to be singing today, onward Christian soldier, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus, going on before. You know, I, I've, I've had a couple of weeks off or so, and, um, and, and I've had a lot of thinking to do. And I had a lot of praying to do. And I know you folks do that too. And even if I haven't been away, I still got a lot of thinking to do and a lot of praying to do. But uh, I, I tell you, you know, it, it's amazing when, when you watch God's folks, isn't it? Uh, it? It's amazing how God's folks respond to certain things. Uh, just for example, uh, this, this uh, COVID-19 thing, it's an amazing. It's come in my house and it's gone in my house. Praise God. I feel bulletproof today. I could charge hell with just one water pistol this morning. Amen. But isn't it amazing how, how, the, how the devil wants us just to, just to survive rather than to thrive? Uh, the devil doesn't want you to engage. The devil wants you to surrender. The devil wants you to hunker down in your house. You just hunker down in there, and the catch word today is, be safe. Be safe. Now, why is that? Why do Christians say to one another, be safe? Be like Jesus. And you know, we got missionaries out there on the field. They work among lepers. We got missionaries out there who work among diseases. We got missionaries out there who put their life on the line day after day for the cause of Christ. And I have resolved in my own heart, ladies and gentlemen. I think when I was surrendering to the ministry. I don't think I've ever said this to anybody, but when I was talking to my pastor at that time, I said, man, I am ready to die for Jesus. And I had changed my mind. You know, I'm going to die unless, the, praise God, the rapture comes. That's the way I want to go. Amen? But I want to die obeying God rather than dying disobeying God. And so the devil wants us to just survive. Hunker down in your home. And isn't it amazing how some of these hunker down folks do? Especially some of our hunker down Christians. Now, I'm really a little unfiltered now, so you Facebook folks, y'all just hang on, all right? Just turn it off if you need to turn it off because this preacher ain't playing games no more. I ain't been playing games for a while anyway, but I'm tired of playing games. But anyway, isn't it amazing, ladies and gentlemen? I saw them. I saw some of our folks in their minivans and some driving around. Isn't it amazing that you can't catch the COVID-19 at Lowe's? You can't get it down at Walmart. You can't get it going get your toilet paper. You can't get it down at the restaurant. But, brother, you can get it down at the church. You can get it at the church. 
And they're, they're everywhere, going wherever they want to go. And you know who I'm talking about. You know my mom and dad are in heaven. Kim's mom and dad are in heaven. So we're not running any risk of any whipping, so I can say what I want to say now. Amen. <laughs> but uh, isn't it true? And y'all know people just like that. Man, I'm going to die one day. It's appointed unto man once to die, but I'm going to die obeying Jesus rather than obeying the devil and living a low life and, and living some way like uh, he wants me to live. Amen. Amen. I, I have resolved, man, if I, if I die a martyr's death, then so be it. The blood of the martyrs is crying out from the altar now for vengeance. And God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, thus saith the Lord. You see, we think of God as a holy God, uh, um, a God of love, and he is, praise God. But he's also a holy God, and he will deal with sin. So here you have it, ladies and gentlemen. You know, uh, you got a mandate for victory. And our ultimate enemy, by the way, and, and, and there are people who will not come to our churches anymore, and most of the time folks who won't come to church, I know everybody's got a lot of excuses that this, you know, I run out of peanut butter at the house, so if I had some Jif peanut butter, I could, I'd be okay and I'd come to church. But, you know, a lot of folks have had, most people who stop coming to church have had a bad experience at church. You look, read the statistics. Somebody didn't speak to you down the hall and you got offended. Um, somebody got your seat and, or somebody made you get up because you had their seat, you know. So, I mean, crazy, foolish things. But it is high time the church of the Lord Jesus Christ quit fighting among themselves because we're not one, each other's enemy. The devil is our enemy and we can kick him in the teeth and we can hate him and it'd be all right. Amen. I'm not sweating a little bit. I don't know. But I'm having a good time. Y'all have a good time? I like it. I like it. Our ultimate enemy is the, the devil. Listen to this verse. Ephesians 6, 12 says this. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. There is a formidable enemy out there. His name is the devil, but praise God, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We're on the right side. Now, I don't know how accurate this is, but I was told that 20% of the people in the average church today do all the heavy lifting. Y'all think that's true? 20% of the people in the average church today does the heavy lifting. And, and they tell me that uh, only 10% of the church gives a tithe. But 90% do all the complaining. The ones who don't give. Dr. Agent Rogers, who was a great preacher of yesteryear, he still preaches today. We used to call him the Prince of Preachers. I remember the last time I heard him preach at First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, he told us preacher boys, he said, you go home and tell your family persecution is on the way. He said this about wealth. Agent Rogers said, There's, there, there have been generally three steps to every great fortune that has ever been lost. Three steps to every great fortune that has ever been lost. One generation generates. The next generation speculates. And the third generation dissipates. And unfortunately, I think we're in a generation where there's a lot of dissipations going on. Just dis wealth disappearing. I'm afraid there's a lot of dissipators in the average church today. You know, if you read Paul's epistles you'll see that we're at war and we're always going to be at war until the Lord Jesus Christ calls us home. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to get over this idea that it's all honey and no bees. There's a lot of bees out there and they'll sting you in a heartbeat. But boy, when you got honey, you're going to have some bees. So right here, God is saying there's a mandate for victory. I want you to know with all your heart today and I want you to believe it with all your heart today because it is true whether you believe it or not. God has a mandate for you to win and not to lose. Now, I want you to look at the method for victory here. Look at 2 Kings 13. God gives us a method for victory, beginning with the weapons we must employ. So, okay, how am I going to go about this? Getting victory every single day of my life. You've got to do your part. God does his part, but I've got to do my part too. So, look at the weapons we must employ. Look at verse 15. He says, take a bow and some arrows. And then in verse 17, Elisha calls the arrow 
the era of the Lord's deliverance, which is, listen, it is highly symbolic of, of the spiritual realm. So what are the weapons we must employ? I want you to jot this verse of Scripture down. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and it's verse 4 and 5. And here's what that verse says, or those two verses say. It says, for, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every, watch this, thought, thought into captivity to the obedience in Christ. For example, apostasy. Have you ever heard of apostasy? Apostasy is a thought. You can't shoot it down with a gun and bullets. You do it with the Word of God. Black Lives Matter a thought. It's a philosophy. Socialism, critical race theory, and I'm, I praise God that Trump kicked that out of the Pentagon, that our nation was somehow founded in racism. That is from the pit of hell. Not true. So all those things, critical race theory, and some in our convention have adopted that. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. Critical race theory, Black Lives Matter, socialism, all those are thoughts. How do you go about winning, beating them? The Word of God. That's how you do it, the Word of God. God is our battle axe. Our artillery is prayer. The Holy Spirit is our ally. Faith is our shield. And that's how we go about beating these false ideologies and philosophies that have permeated our society. You beat them with the Word of God. So then notice the weakness we must empower. So there's the weapon we must employ. It is spiritual, the Word of God. And then there's the weakness we must empower. So notice that the king comes to the prophet because he feels so overwhelmed and he feels powerless. The prophet tells the king to take a, bat, a bow and some arrows and then shoot the arrow. But just before he shoots the arrow, watch this. Just before the king shoots the arrow, the man of God puts his hand on the king's hand. So what's that symbolic of? That's symbolic of the touch of God. We need a, a fresh touch of God in our churches today. We need it in our families. We need it in our individual personal Christian lives. God, give us a fresh touch today. And that's what he did for the king. His hand on the king's hand. So the weakness of the king is now being empowered by the touch of God. We need a touch of God in our nation. We need a touch of God in every area of our institutions in our country because many of them have gone awry. And then notice the third thing here, the wickedness that we must encounter. So there's the weapons we must employ. They are spiritual. There's the weakness we must empower. We need a touch of God. And then there's the weakness we must encounter. Elijah told the king to open up the east window. Now, the question is, why open up the east window? Because that's where the enemy is. The enemy wasn't over on the west. He was on the east window. Open up the east window. Take the bow. Take the arrow. The arrow of God's deliverance and shoot it. He said, open the window. And you can't shoot arrows through closed windows. Open up the window. In other words, what he's saying to the king, king, you have got to face your fears. King, you have got to face the enemy. You can't just hunker down and wait for it yourself to be defeated. You've got to face it. And that's what he does. He opens up the east window. He shoots the arrow. And in that day and time, ladies and gentlemen, in that, in that history, when a nation shot an arrow toward the land of the enemy, it was a declaration of war. It was a declaration of war. And ladies and gentlemen, 
We are at war. Praise God the war's been won. But as long as you're here on planet Earth, the devil is going to oppose you. And you've got to face what fears you have. You've got to face the enemy. And you've got to engage. God, you know, only God knows, and maybe just a few people, if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would have stood up, believed on the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary, this election, there is no... Te- the algorithms or whatever those things are called, they would go bunkers even more than what they did. They'd have to be calling the election off for many, many, many days so that they can get their crony ballots in that are so phony and fake. And we're going to see something very interesting in the next few days. Here's what I've been thinking about this. You know, when it comes to uh, Trump winning, and, and all, a lot of us have been praying. You know, some people say he may have gotten 100 million votes if it hadn't been for all this cheating that's going on. And, and you think about what's going on. It, it, God is the one who sets up kings and he takes them down. Read it in the book. None of this has caught God by surprise. But isn't it interesting that the media, the political elite, the, the academic elites, the never-Trumpers, you could just go down the line, all these people that are against this presidency. And this presidency has done more for the church and religious liberty than any presidency in our lifetime. And shame on you if you didn't vote the right way this time. Because you just voted for judgment to come if Trump is not there. You ain't seen nothing yet. Justice Alita came out just a couple of weeks ago, said this. When it comes to religious liberty, ladies and gentlemen, Trump has fought for this. His administration has fought for this. No matter what you think about the man, we, we're, not, we're not personality voters. We, we are policy voters, people who carry our water the best. But even at that, God is still sovereign, and he can, he can still do anything. He is the ace in the hole, if I may say that. And, hey, I don't care what's against us. If God is for you, who can be against you? Amen? But, but ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing about it. You think about all the things that are against this presidency right now, and if Trump still gets it, and, all, and I know some folks over here saying, we know he's got it. We know he's got it. It's going to be a God thing because God will do it in such a way that he gets the glory for it. Amen. Give God the praise. So true. So true. I still can't believe how, how somebody, you look at the party platform, and I am pro-life all the way, and you call yourself a Christian, and you vote for people who believe in murdering babies, Shame on you. I told you I'm unfiltered. Go ahead, Facebook. Turn it off. We don't need you anyway. So there's the warfare we must... I'm not done yet. How time is it? All right, we got one more to go. You ready? We might have to just stand up in the middle of it and stretch. Stand up, stretch a little bit. The measure of victory. I want you to watch this because this is very interesting. I don't know about you, man, but I am a, I, I'm a sore loser. We got any sore losers out there? I hate losing. I don't care what it is. If I'm playing ping pong or whatever it may be, I don't like to lose. And um, I used to pull for certain teams that I got to losing so much. Now I never mention them anymore. Amen. Can I get a witness? <laughs> I don't want to be associated with that. I don't want to be identified with it. I'm a winner in Christ Jesus. So let me, anyway, let me show you the measure of victory. You know, I'm really a teddy bear at heart, so all you Facebook people, just hang in there. I, I love you. I love you anyway. Uh, look at verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times. He, shouldn't have, he should have unloaded the quiver. That's what was, he was called to do, unload the quiver. Shoot all the arrows. But here's the king. He only shoots three times to the ground. So what was that? That was a lack of faith. That was an act of disobedience. And the man of God's angry. He's 80 years old, about to die, got an illness, but he's got enough fire in his belly to get mad about it. God give us a fire in the belly again. So he says, strike the ground, struck three times, he stopped, and the man of God was angry with him, and he said, you should have struck five or six times, then you would have struck Syria two... You could have destroyed Syria. 
But now you're going to have just a few victories. And Syria is going to stay around to pester you for a lot longer. So let me ask you a question. How many of you, I mean, how many of you, ladies and gentlemen, do you really want to settle for a few victories? Man, I don't. I want the whole enchilada. House Senate presidency. I want it all. But there's a lot of people settling just for a few victories. And the enemy's going to continue to pester you till you get called home. I believe God today wants us to have a burning, blazing, passionate, emotional love for Christ, His Word, and His church like never before. I was reading this past week. Um, I've used this before, but it's so good I like using it again. There's this African guy who was converted to biblical Christianity. And I like to call it biblical Christianity because not all Christianity is Christianity. But this African, he was a Muslim. And we all know Muslims will kill you in a heartbeat, the radical ones especially. But boy, you're the infidel and they'll rather take you out. So, so here's this African who came to Christ he knew he was going to die a martyr's death because of his conversion. And I want you to listen to what he said. He wrote a letter before he became a martyr. He said this, this young African man. He said, he said, I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. My, the decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. He said, my past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. He said, I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf gold. He said, my face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few, my God is reliable, my mission is clear. He says, I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach to everyone knows, Work till he stops me, and when he comes for his own, he will have no trouble recognizing me because my banner would have been clear. Praise God. Let's stand and let's give God the glory today, for he is a great God, and you are victors, victors, victors in Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is true. Lord, there's no more gray area in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're either, you're either hot or you're not. And so today, Father, we just recommit ourselves to you afresh and anew, saying, God, you just empower us with your faith, with faith. Empower us with your grace, your love, your mercy. Surround us with the mightiest of your angels. May the angel of the Lord encamp around those who fear God and delivers them out of all their troubles. No weapon of warfare formed against us shall prosper. And, Lord, we may die a martyr's death, but we're no greater than our master. And if that be it, then it will be it. But our banner will be clear. And, dear God, we will serve you faithfully to the very end, no matter what the devil says or what the world says, because we love Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.